Now, let's share the word of God, taking hold of God's promises. Taking hold of God's promises. Taking hold of God's promises. And our text is Joshua chapter 1. Joshua chapter 1. You realize Joshua chapter 1 is mainly uh, a moment or a chapter or scriptures that address the practical aspect of taking hold, entering, taking hold of God's promises. The Bible says, after the death of Moses, that is Joshua chapter 1, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, Moses, my servant is dead. Now therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all these people, to the land which I'm going, I'm giving to them, the children of Israel. Every place the sore of your feet will tread upon, I have given you, as I said to Moses, from the wilderness of Lebanon, as far as, as, far as the great river of River Euphrates, all the land of, of the Hattites, and the great sea towards the going down of the sun shall be your territory. You know, there are times when God, in a very expressive way, open you, bring to your understanding and awakening that now you are no longer going to sing about the promise. You are no longer going to sing, to, to, to sing about the hope that you have the future in the promise, now is the fulfillment. Now you are entering. It's like a young bride and a young and bridegroom. Eh? You've been waiting in the church and God, when you bless me with a husband, I'll be so happy. There are times we tell you now, brother, you are, not, you are not looking forward to it. You are not hoping for it. Now it's your wedding day. This is the bride this is the bridegroom. Some of you mothers, as a young lady, used to say, God, I'm looking forward for that moment when I'll hold my own baby. Only to discover, no, you already have one. Or maybe two, by God's grace. You are not talking about the future. You are not talking about a, a day, a season, a moment when you have your own baby's children, you already have them. And Brothers and sisters, in Jesus' name, I always believe every moment of life has two aspects. One, the things that you have already and the things that you hope for. And there are times when God says, it is time now to take hold of what I promised. And that's what Joshua chapter 1 is all about. You know, this is not a matter of weight. It's not a matter of uh, hope for. It's not a matter of be patient for. It's a matter of rise up, close over, take. Rise up, cross this Jordan, and take. That is very, very important. A moment when you arise, a moment when you cross over, a moment when you take. And that's why God is saying to Joshua, Joshua, arise now. Go over. What you used to sing for about? What you used to preach about? What you used to anticipate for? What you used to look forward to? Now is not a matter of looking forward to add it. It's a matter of arise, close over, and take. My friend, I also want to declare there should be something in your life today that God is saying arise, close over, and take. Arise, cross over, and occupy. There should be something. There should be something. You can't live all the years singing a song of hope, a song of expectation, a song of uh, looking forward to, 
and sometimes a song of procrastination. There are, there are people who, when you get closer to something, you postpone. You know, one of the weapons, according to Ephesians chapter 6, if you go through from verse 12, one of the key weapons that God has given us and you should put on, it is readiness. Readiness. One of, that weapon is as important as other weapons. And, and, and I have come to discover most majority of Christians are not ready. Are not ready. Uh, yesterday night I was sharing about uh, Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 and 2. It says, uh, 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 put down any heavy thing that besets you and any sin, sin that entangles you. And you run the race set before you. Looking unto Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. Life is a matter of race. Why do we, where? Why do we run? I want to give you three, three reasons. You, you, life, you must run because if you delay, there are things that will never wait for you. Time will never wait for you. Time will never wait for you. You must run. And space, space, space will never wait for you. If today you find a space somewhere, if you delay, somebody else who is awake will take it. Space will not wait for you. Another thing that will never wait for you is your age. If today you don't run your race, age will not wait for you. You will still grow old. If you, if you are so sleepy, so lazy, so much entangled, some of us, you are living, you are not on time, you are living out of time. Yeah, you are a girl of 17 years and already you have been entangled with so many issues, so evil. Instead of, I always tell young people, at the age of 17, 18, 19, and whatever, what you do with that time is your head. If somebody today has a master's degree, master's degree is in the brain. If somebody today is a professional in some course, most of it is in the brain. It is the brain that, that you train fast. So that the brain can command other aspects of the body. Let me, introduce, let me say this. You have the heart, the mind, and the body. The heart gets saved. The heart receives the Holy Spirit. Ah, when the heart is changed, when your spirit is changed, it influences your mind. Your mind also influences your body. Have you ever known if you take your son to a better, better, best school and the heart is not changed? Failure to have the heart changed. However, however, however bright that sun is, is, he's likely to fail. Because the spirit of human being, which is never transformed, will eventually destroy the talents. Or will eventually, in a very, very strange way, lead the gifting, the performance, and the talents Later late valueless. I've shared with you, parents, some of you. You say, no, my, you know, Bishop, my son performed very well in primary school. It's okay. In high school, it's excellent. It's okay. In university, he never went through even the second year. Why? Drugs. What else? Your daughter, a teenage. I know bright. I know during our time, I had this lady who was so bright. He could pass all. Exams, went to Alliance Girls, passed everything. Be out there, be out there, no performance, no performance. Why? Because the heart, which is the headquarter of life, was never transformed. If, and parents don't just pay school fees. You might be paying school fees for untransformed heart. An untransformed heart will fail, will influence your mind, the mind of that person. And that's why we are failing. We are very good in working very hard. We are very good in sacrificing ourselves as parents, but we fail to take time to, 
transform the heart. You parents, I want to, to challenge you. When you arrive in church late with your children, you know, you are, you are putting an impression in their lives that church is not very important. Your son is able to see you wake up very early on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, very early at five because you honor your business. But the same son will see you on Saturday oversleeping, alive in the church worship service late, and the son knows that the church has no value in their family. Business has more value than the church. And when you come to the church, you are not so serious about it. After, even, even before the service is over, you've already walked out with your children. Because in the afternoon, or maybe after two hours, you want to take them out for dinner. And there is little, there's no impression or impartation on children on the value of Jesus Christ. Then that's why after we work so hard, we work so hard, things are not becoming better. I want to say to the parents, by the grace of God, human being has three areas. The headquarter, the main area is the spirit. That human spirit. That breath of God in us, human spirit. The second area is the soul or maybe the mind. The third area is the body. You feed the body, but you feel to feed the headquarter of life, the spirit. Your daughter, even yourself, you fail one day. You feed your mind with a lot of philosophy. And you fail to feed your heart with the fear of God. Philosophy will confuse you. And let's start from the heart. Let the heart win. Let the gospel win the heart. Let the spirit of your son, your spirit, receive the anointing and the truth of God the less you follow. That's very important. And with that in mind, friends, they are, because you are, you are, you are, your heart, the might, and the body are in the right perspective, you realize every moment of life, it has two aspects. Something that you achieve now and celebrate now and something that you hope for tomorrow. I declare on you, if every moment Every moment you live, your life is dry. All what you have is things you hope for. As well, the youth, they talk about, you know, Bishop, one day I'll drive such a car. And then you grow older. Age of 30. Bishop, one day I'll drive such a car. At the age of 40, one day I'll drive such a car. You see, you've never enjoyed the drive. You've never enjoyed that car. You've never. Even at the age of 60, you are saying... I used, you know, at the age of 60 years, you say, I used to desire such a car. You grow old saying, I used to desire such a house, but I never got it. I used to look forward for such a marriage, but I never enjoyed it. Be, be, below 50, you say, I'm still looking forward for a better wife. Because there are people even now, at the age of 50, you are married. And yet, you are yet looking forward for a better husband, better wife. You never work out your current marriage, the right one, the right one. What do you think? A man at the age of 40, at the age of 50, you have three children and a wife. And yet, you are mistreating them because you are still looking forward for a better wife. The same with husbands. A husband with a, the, the wife, a wife with three children with a husband. And you are still looking forward for a better husband. And you never, never serve and love the one you have with all your heart. Let me warn you. Do not joke around. You are growing old. Age will not wait for such, such deception. I now pray any deception in your mind should be over now. The blood of Christ remove deception. Accept the truth now. If you are 40 years and you are married, you are married, work out your marriage. Work out your marriage. That is very, very important. There are others now. You live a life that has no, you live a life whereby you ignore the three parts of, of life. Heart, mind, body. 
When you are marrying, you never allowed your heart and your mind to decide. You just found a man around and starting, you, you, you eloped having sex. You never allowed your mind and your heart to speak. I want to encourage you. Any decision you make in life, allow your whole being to participate. Your spirit, your mind, and your body. However much you admire that lady, can you please allow your spirit where God resides also to decide? Can you allow your mind to think? Because some of you people, you just follow a human being somewhere, a being. You don't even understand how that man is. And you start having children. And then after one year, eh, when the feelings subside, when the emotions of your body subside, when you have met the desires of your lust, and you are over. When you start growing old. When you realize in your marriage that your husband never had any vow or commitment. Commitment to you. Like now during the wedding. We make vows with the extremes. I accept you in all level of adversity. Eh? When you be in poverty and in wealth. Sometimes you can even say in darkness and light. In lack. In sickness and health. Do you know some of you people, the husband you have, the wife you have, never had a commitment of heart to be with you in sickness and health. Never had any respect for your body. That man just used your body. He never even appreciate your mother and your dad. And yet, yet, you, yet you are following somebody without a commitment that is so clear. And then later you realize, oh, in this marriage, I feel to use my might. But you already know it. In this marriage, I feel to use my heart. And you're still in it. I would like to, 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 I would like to say this. For you to, 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 to attain such a season whereby God can come around at the age of 30. And speak to you like Joshua and tell you, arise now and cross over. Why? Because there is something for this season. And then at the age of 40, God tells you, arise now and put up a commercial building. I'm giving this to you. For God to speak to you and cause you to attain some blessings for every season, you must establish a good foundation. A good foundation and a good foundation and good structure in life always gives you some prospects. Yes, any building you put up, and you know very well of, on how you worked on the foundation, you know very well, you are there, you spent some time, you use some material, you really work on foundation. Even if you go up the third, the fourth story, and you, you know very well, I know the foundation. Please do not fail to put up, to put a good foundation. The second thing, the structure you use as you grow up. As you grow up. You know there's no stage as you build up where you ignored the right material. You know very well, you never, never, at the age of 18, you never ignored the right material. At the age of 20, you never ignored the right material for that, that stage. At the age of 40, you never ignored the right material for the structure of life in that stage. When you grow older, you have foundation. You'll be convinced. I know what I did in the foundation. I know what I did at the age of 20. I know the material I used to build my life at the age of 30. And when you be at the age of 60, you will not neglect you will say, I have run the race well. I never stopped on the way. I was so steady in my race. I was so consistent in my race. I kept the lane. I ran the race and I kept the lane. I never walked out of the lane. I never compromised the rule of the race. I know I obeyed the rule. I kept the rest and I also kept my lane. You will never be disappointed. 
Do you know when you obey the law, even the Holy Spirit will speak to your heart and confirm you, and you feel, I know I have walked the right way. That's why Paul would say, at the point of death, he'll say, I've kept the faith, I have ran the race, and have finished my course. The three things in life that you should have, your race, your faith, and your cause. Your race, your faith, and your cause. That's very important. Very, very important. Cause is a talent. Cause is a talent. Cause is something that you attain maybe at a younger, tender life that you can call occupation that God appointed for you. And what? Can I tell you something? Anybody who is working within his talent is blessed. God can bless you if you operate within your gift and talent. And I, I, I would like you to overcome the devil. Overcome the confusion. Get your talent. I tell you, you make a lot of money. You make a lot of money. When your mind is convinced and you feel comfortable, I am now in my... Like now me, I'm a preacher. I tell the truth. When I'm preaching the gospel, in the crusades, in the revivals, I tell you, I feel I am doing the right thing. When I'm planting churches, I sense, ah, and the more I preach, the more my life is blessed and enhanced. God, you bless you. And because of that, friends, I want to announce to you, if you live right, you always have such a stage where God says, now arise, cross over, and occupy. Hallelujah. Now, I want to declare one or two rules. Uh, one or two, one or three, maybe three areas about, about taking hold of a promise that God gave you. One, promise number one that God gave Joshua is that I will give the Lord. The first promise that clears your mind is when God says, I will give you what I promised. I am going to make them occupy what I vowed. It, when God brings an authoritative, infallible, final statement, I'm giving. If you follow God very well, I want to hear, to hear this. If you follow God very well, this will always occur in your life. I am giving you. I I'm giving you this. Let me say this. Have you ever seen with the money or without money? You walk across. I remember one time I was uh, I saw a vehicle in a showroom and I said, God, this should be my, this, I should get this vehicle. It's a nice one. I like it. And, and, you, and you say to your heart, the Holy Ghost says, I'm giving you that vehicle. I'm giving you. And that one will create a mobility, a raise in you, knowing that, you know, whenever God says, I will give you, he also releases anointing and power, faith, provision for that statement. If today God says to you, I'm giving you such a house, you sense in your mind, in your heart, there is power, there is faith, there is quickening. There is clearance for such promise. The second thing that God you, the God you do as you take hold of his promise, if you check, the Bible says, is, 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 uh, is the power for victory as you occupy the promise. The Bible says, no one will be able to start before you. If you check, if you check the Bible, Joshua chapter 1, the Bible says, uh-huh, that is, uh, when God gives the extent of the Lord, if you go to verse 5, no man shall be able to start before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. God will give you assurance of security, victory of a man and all impediments. You know, that's why God says, our weapons are not carnal. If you read 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4, our weapons are not carnal, 
but they are mighty. They are very strong in God, even to the pulling down of strongholds and bringing to subjection every thought that exhausts itself above the knowledge of God. Now, you see, when the Bible talks about our weapons, we are not, the Bible does not talk about trying. Guess what? It says our weapons are strong. Why not? Number two, they are able to pull down stronghold. It doesn't say, it doesn't say it, can, it can. It says they are able. God gives you a clear strength, clear anointing over every hardship. And number three, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. The third level of promise where God says, I will never leave you. If you go to verse 5, no, one, no man will be able to stand before you. And the God says, number 2 of that verse, part B, I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. The Lord never gives his promise to you and then he stays back and you go alone. He said, this is my promise. It is to you. I'll go with you. And this is the characteristic of my work with you. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. Another level, I will not leave you. I will be with you. I'll never forsake you. I will be with you. Because you know why God is with you? Because you bear his promise. That's what God says in Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 12. He hastens to his word to perform it. God look into his word. Not your feelings. People these days are ignoring the word. And what you bring to God is feelings. God today, I want to confirm to you. Make sure you capture what God has said. Because God will hasten to that word to perform it. As you pray, present a promise. God says, I will be with you. I will never forsake you. I will never leave you. Now, there are barriers that we need to overcome as we handle the promise. Barrier number one. Natural and personal handicaps. There are two there are barriers that we need to overcome if you are going to, over, to, over, to overtake and occupy a promise. You need to overcome natural, natural, and personal. Your own personal, my own personal handicaps. And that's why if you go to Joshua, if you go to Joshua, I think Joshua chapter 3, uh, verse 14, the Bible says, Aha. Uh -huh. So it was when the people set out from their camp to cross over the Jordan with the priest bearing the Ark of the Covenant before the people, and as those, I hope you are there, and as those who bore the Ark came to Jordan, and the feet of the priest who brought the Ark dipped in the edge of the water, verse 16, that the waters which came down from upstream stood still and rose in a heap very far away at Adam. So the waters that went down in the sea of Arabah, the salt sea failed and were cut off and people crossed over. What is that? A natural, a natural handicap. They are crossing over by this Jordan. And God gave them ability to close over. Before you occupy, you realize there could be a natural handicap to overcome. God will give you victory over it. It's natural. It's natural. No, you can't get to promised land without crossing over Jordan. And there's no bridge. And God says, I want, I'll, not, I'll not forsake you. And I want to take you through this natural handicap. And that's very, very important, friends. If you go to verse 17 of the same chapter, you realize that uh, that is chapter 3, verse 17. And the priests who bother the earth, they cross over the dry land. That's very important. Another thing that you need to overcome is human 
and demonic opposition. Human and demonic opposition. This time is not natural. This time it is human beings. And that's why God says, on that land where you are going, although it belongs to you, Hathites, Amorites, stronger tribes are sitting on the land. And for you to occupy it, you must drive out those tribes. You know, God said the tribes that inhabited the promised land were stronger than Israel in this manner. You know, Israel has spent all the time in the wilderness. So they, they didn't have time to build up a strong army. They did not have time to settle and maybe build army barracks. They did not have time to, to, to replenish their strength. You know, they, they walked every day in the desert. They did not have to, time to develop the armor, the weapons. But the people in, in the promised land, in Canaan, they had settled for many years. Like Jericho was a very old city. They had settled there. They had built strong walls. And now, for them to settle, they had to bring down those walls and they had to drive out the, the inhabitants who are occupying the land that God promised them. Sometimes you, don't, you may not get an open ground. What you, you get around is something that God wants to give to you, but somebody who appears to be stronger than you is sitting on it. Maybe you are company's manager, or maybe you, you, you are uncle, or you are grandfather, whoever that person is. Or maybe somebody who appears to be so threatening, his personality is so strong, and yet he is the person who is supposed to write you a check. He is the person who is supposed to clear you for scholarship. But let me tell you, you are not going to compromise. God says our weapons are not carnal. They are mighty in God to pull down. When we talk about pulling down, it is something that is already stretched up above you. There are things to pull down if you are going to set on your promise. Things that are above you. But do you know how you pull them down? Just because you have the weapons of God. And the weapons of God are not carnal. They are mighty in God. Somebody is sitting on your promise. Stronger than you. That's how you need to know how to pull down. Don't tell me, Bishop, I've come to an end. How do you come to an end? And yet, God has not been involved. Why don't you allow God to take his position? And when God takes his position, you will not say, I have come to an end. You will say, I'm starting a new season. Whenever God takes his position in your battle, you don't say, I have come to an end. You don't say you are exhausted. You say, I'm renewed for another season. No one in the church should come to a terminal end. No terminal end. Even in heaven, you will live, live forever. That's very important, very, very important by God's grace. Another thing that you need to overcome is human sin. If you allow sin in your life, immorality, fornication, masturbation, that's satanic defilement. God will not give you a promise. And that's why many young people, however bright you are, what is spoiling your, cap your capacity is sin. This is a young man who turned around to be a, to be a, uh, to be a homosexual, lesbian, whatever. I'm talking about the men of God, women of God. I'm not talking about whoever, whoever. I don't, I'm talking about the kingdom we belong to. We need to have the principles of God if it is God who will give us the promise. If you read Joshua chapter 7 verse 7, there are this city, small city, and you go through because you don't have much time. A small city that Joshua could have overcome with few, few members of the army, but he was defeated just because there was sin. You know, Achan, Achan, and, and, and whatever. Read that story. Sin in the cup. And Joshua realized they are losing so many soldiers. 
Instead of overcoming, you know God has said, no man will be able to start against you. But this time, men stood against Joshua because of sin. Read Joshua chapter 7 and you understand that. Another thing that is barrier is human effort without God. Human effort without God is a barrier to promise. Anytime you, you if you read Joshua chapter 9, read the story of Gibeonites. When Joshua and Israel developed some tactics, some funny tactics of compromising with the Gibeonites, instead of God said, drive them out. But now they were able to, there was some deception and they compromised. It brought a problem. There are people when you get some money, instead of trusting God, instead of praying, you say, I have my way of, I have way of bribing. I have a capacity of bribing my way through. I'll see the big man. I'll see the chief. I'll see the manager. We'll have dinner together. I have capacity of making my way through because of money. When you forget that you started the journey for the promise by God, the promise is by God and the God is pure. And you end up using human effort human effort now whereby you mix the human effort with god well decision without seeking god's counsel you you bring your human effort and put barrier to the move of god and that's what i'm saying decision without seeking god's counsel compromising this is something that comes later. A brother in the church started off very well. Very well. Fear of God. But later, after making friends, becoming fame, becoming conspicuous, you know, you are now a great person around. You don't have to bow to God. You can use your position anyhow. And you can compromise here and there. Don't do it. Keep the fear of God because one of the barriers to the promise is when you use the human effort to substitute God's will. May God help us in just Christ's name. Hallelujah. Oh, the Lord bless so much. Take hold of God's promises. Take hold. And I say by God's grace, live right. Live right. Fear God. Command your heart to fear God. Command your mind to bow to God. Command your senses to be aligned with God's discipline. And every moment, God is saying, even today, cross over. Another day, cross over. Cross over. Because every day, God is giving you a new territory to occupy. Because God wants you to take hold of his promises. My God, I bless you. Bless my life and bless all those who listen to this word. That from today, by what you have taught us, by what you have taught us, we will arise and take hold of the promises. It is possible. You did it then. You are doing it now. You will never leave us. You will never forsake us, oh God. And we even today believe as we walk with you, no man will be able to stand against us. We love you. In Christ we pray.